rev up those fryers because we've got another episode of the library of error featuring oh my back Featuring why human evolution is false, the scientific case for independent origins, has ape to man evolution been overturned by YouTuber standing for truth. I'm recording this right after the other episode because we're in the middle of the world's worst appendix. Worse than the kind that burst. Hmm. But we had to split it into two because there is just too much to go over. There's, um, Brandolini's Law, I think is what it's called, where it's like it takes significantly more effort to correct something than it does to just say the wrong thing in the first place. Ah, but we've got a lot to get through. So let's do so. Let's, let's, let's rev up those friars. We're beginning with Box Grove Man, constructed by Romat's Accord here, from only a single shin bone and two teeth were ever found. I mean, again, like, I don't know why I keep expecting sentence structure to be complete. Um, I was recently accused of being too mean and too sassy by CMI, Creation Ministries International. That's the one. Um, so, you know, I'm feeling that maybe instead of trying to refute that, I'm just going to lean into it and be a bit sassier. This isn't a good sentence. Boxgrove man constructed from only a single shin bone and two teeth were ever found. I've said it before and I'll say it again. It's not that hard to hire an editor. Evolutionist fanatics had a field day with this one and not only made up what the pre-human transition missing link looked like, but also his entire people's life story throughout history. Reality belonged to Homo heidelbergensis and was nothing but a totally human shin bone found. That's another sentence that is really just, I'm just reading it correctly. Um, reconstruction and testing showed he or she was about 40 years old, about five foot 11 inches tall and weighed roughly 200 pounds. It is, to this day, still thought to be the oldest human ever, fo ever human fossil ever discovered in Britain. That one was my fault. And yet it is totally modern human. Another fraud, yet again. I mean, we already went over how Homo heidelbergensis in the previous episode is not the same thing as an anatomically modern human. Which is what he's arguing here. Okay, the, the, the brain case overlaps, indeed, although it's on the small side. The average tends to be on the small side. But the facial morphology is entirely unique, and the proportions are also um, kind of within their own range. I'm struggling to understand why this is being included, though, because Boxgrove Man, as you can see in, in the picture that I've got behind here, to my knowledge, has always been thought to be Homo heidelbergensis. Like, I don't think anybody ever, like, picked Boxgrove Man and depicted it as they have in this picture here, and we're thinking that it's like a super basal ape, right? Um, but I mean, that's, I guess that's just my opinion. You know, when you go to the Wikipedia page on it or, or dig any deeper on the original find, it, it does seem indeed that Boxgrove Man has always been thought to be Homo heidelbergensis. Um, it was found in Boxgrove near West Sussex. Um, but it, like, I don't think this was ever thought to be anything other than Homo heidelbergensis. So, you know, I don't know why we're, we're pretending like this was a groundbreaking failure for, for human evolution. It's like human evolution says a thing, still holds that thing, but our, our you know, honey aficionado here decides to come in and tell us that, <laughs> breaking news, you were right all along. <laughs> cool. Next up is Log Lothagum Man, originally sold as a missing link. Later, investigation looking at the roots of the teeth and general proportions resemble those of later modern hominins, aka totally modern human. Okay, there's a huge problem here. You probably see what it is. Resembling later modern hominins is not the same thing as an anatomically modern human. Those are not analogous to one another, like, or those aren't superimposable, rather. Even had thin enamel on its molars like modern people. I don't know why this is written like a conversation that you would have three drinks in. Even though it was found in the supposed 5.5 to 8 million years ago sedimentary deposits. Fraud. And then he has a, a nice little clipped picture down here that says, A specimen from the 5 to 6 million year old, million year old site of Lothagum was the most complete but only was a piece of jaw with a molar tooth that looked hominid. The height of the jaw was greater than that of an ape, and the molar was flat and low crowned like a, ho like a hominid. The Lothigam jaw was considered the first evidence of hominids in the entire fossil record. 
another nearby side, and he cuts it off. As you can see, at the exact time primitive man was supposed to be splitting from apes six million years ago, they found the modern human remains dating to the exact time period, and then he has in all caps, STUPID, <laughs> just to really hammer it home there. I hope you can see that. Um, so let's, let's, let's have a field day with this one too, shall we? Lotha again, man. Oh wow. It looks like it's not being proposed as a, uh, hmm, as a, um, <laughs> anatomically modern human. How shocking. It's almost like this keeps happening. Let's see here. G store, Lothagum, record faunal change. We want the hominin. Hominin. Let's see. Lothagum, mandible, human, hominin, fossil. Cool. Known for a piece of jaw. Let's see if we can get this whole thing from old Britannica here. Um, get the summary and then move to the literature. Okie dokie. Okay. It's a paleoanthropological excavation in northern Kenya, west of Lake Turkana, southwest of Lake Turkana. Known for a piece of jaw found there. Uh, member of the human lineage, the hominin, too fragmentary to be identified with certainty, but general proportions resemble those of later hominins. Possibly, be, possibly belong to a member of Artipithecus ramidus, or a member of genus Artipithecus so ramidus or uh, Kadaba. A genus found at the Aramis in the Afar region, um, perhaps related to the hominin Australopithecus, like Artipithecus and other hominins, Lotha gum specimen had thin enamel on its molars. Um, I, so, like, what I'm hearing is someone was like, yeah, it, it kind of reminds us of later, middle to later hominins. And then Ramat was like, middle to later hominins? You mean anatomically modern humans? And then that's that's what he just ran with. <laughs> the Lothagum site is rich with animal fossils. More than 1,000 specimens have been recovered from the deposits. Numerous well-preserved skulls and limb bones of mammals, including monkeys, have been recovered from the site. Uh, but evidence of human evolution is totally absent, except for the fragmentary jaw and two dental pieces at the top layer of the sedimentary deposits. Analysis of the fossil animals indicate that the area had large and slow-moving river with surrounding woodlands, but by 5.5 million years ago, there were open grasslands expanding nearby. That's pretty typical. Um, there's a lot of climatic change going on that many suppose is, is what's spurring our, um, many of our, our human evolution sort of big leaps, such as the, the transition to bipedality, uh, more efficient sweating, thermal regulation, things of that nature. But Google Scholar, let's go to the original paper, shall we? That seems like a great idea. In this in this house, we do original sourcing. <laughs> Off the gun, mandible. Cool. Okay, anatomy and age of the Lothagum mandible. This is from 1992. Um, this is older, so 1986. Let's see if there's anything earlier than that, and then we'll click it and work forward, because I don't actually know very much about this particular mandible, this particular specimen. Okay, now I won't waste too much of your time, so we'll kind of abstract hop here, if you don't mind, and I'll put the links in the description. The Lothagum mandible fragment found in 1967 west of Lake, west of Lake Turkana has been dated to 5.5 million years ago. Date is significant because it lies within the suggested time range during which hominid and pongid clades diverged. Because of its fragmentary condition and great age, this specimen has run the gamut of taxonomic assign, uh, assinations, I guess, uh, from ramipithecine to pongid to hominid. Note that we're using ramipithecine here. This is a very old paper. Uh, these three nomenclatural categories serve as the basis for three hypotheses tested in this study. So it looks like they're doing metric and morphological comparisons, demonstrate its affinity to Australopithecus afarensis, sharing derived hominid stat states in such features as the mental foramen vertical position, uh, ascending ramus in the or ramus origin, breadth of the alveolar margin, and reduction of the hypoconulid and dimensions of M1, the molar one, and the dimensions of the mandibular corpus. So it looks like the original find says that it's an awful bit scene. So let's see, let's see where we go from here. What about 1992? What are we saying in 1992? New anatomical data strengthen the allocation of the Lothagum mandible to the family Hominidae, most similar to the known hominins of Australopithecus afarensis. Hmm, how curious. It looks like we're getting even closer to the Australopithecine, specifically the species of Australopithecus afarensis categorization. What about this 2015 
what are the Lothigum and Tarabin, ta, Tabarin, sorry, can't speak today, Tabarin mandibles. Ooh, John Fox is in this. The mandibular fragments from the Lothigum and Tabarin uh, localities, I guess they're referred to, were once considered plausible candidates for status of earliest hominin. Recent fieldwork, though, has lessened the relevance of these fossils by recovering samples from horizons more than two million years earlier. Yet despite the increase of comparative samples, the two mandibular fragments remain difficult to diagnose. Here we consider the morphology and dental metrics of two specimens in comparison to the larger samples of the Miocene and early Pliocene hominins recovered during the last 15 years. We show, based on the molar size, that KNM TH13150 is consistent with the hypodyme of Artipithecus, while the Lothigum mandible is not consistent with Artipithecus in smaller dimensions. These results have important biogeographic implications and hint at a more, more complex early Pliocene human phylogeny than previously anticipated. So let's see what they do think the Lothigum mandible uh, belongs to. Who it belongs to, I suppose I should say. Okie dokie, Lothigum mandible, if we can find it. Molar matrix. So here's Lothigum, and it looks like Lothigum is mapping with Australopithecines. So, same as previous. <laughs> so, allow us to reconsider for a moment, if you will, um, the fact that <laughs> Raw Matt just looked at it and said it resembles, late, resembles later modern hominins, aka totally modern humans. No one has ever said that it's anything other than an Australopithecine, at least in the literature, the three, you know, uh, papers that we just kind of glanced at, um, just very, very briefly. And even had thin enamel on its molars like modern people. So, guys... <laughs> Oh, Lord Almighty. And animal. So, humans possess the thickest enamel of modern extant um, primates. So the thinner the enamel, the more basal it is. I don't think, like, I don't, I don't think that it's possible to read about enamel thickness um, and its evolution, how it's changed over time, and not glean that very simple, very specific trend of enamel thickens as you get closer to, to anatomically modern humans. And yet, here is Ramat saying that it has thin enamel on its molars like modern people. You, you can't, like, that's just the opposite of right. And, like, again, you know, this is the mantra with the Ramat chapters, right? It's like, I'm not surprised, but I am disappointed, right? It's like, <laughs> as usual. Um, so no, it's it's an Australopithecine, and some folks e are even supposing that it could potentially have a similar to Artipithecus, although that wasn't panned out in, in once it was looked at, kind of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, if, um, methodologically speaking. So no, <laughs> this is not an anatomically modern human jaw. Next, Artipithecus ramidus. That's my favorite hominin. I love Artipithecus ramidus. I think it's the coolest one. Um, let's let's pull it up here so you guys can can see Artie. Artipithecus ramidus. Oops, I don't like Kadaba as much as ramidus. I know that's a little mean, but I just think Artie is kind of cooler. <laughs> Mono um, monomorphic, sexually monomorphic primate. Aren't super common, but it's got these real nice canines. Looks kind of cool. I like Artipithecus ramidus. Um, here's the skull. Now, one thing you want to notice about the skull before we get into this, because I know Ramat's going to complain about it because I've read the book already. Ramat complains that it's a crushed skull. It is a crushed skull. Fortunately, it's crushed so it can be reassembled. Like, most of the pieces are there, as you can see from the skull here. The gray parts have been filled in. But, again, I must emphasize that we are a uh, bilaterally symmetric species. Um, most mammals, all mammals are, to my knowledge. Uh, which means that if you take the line down the middle, right, you can mirror image it. So if you have this side, you know what the other side looks like. So there are going to be bits and pieces that are actually missing here, but given that we have uh, a, a huge lot filled in of the lower mandible over here to the right, and a huge lot of the crania over to the left, it can mirror image over and you end up with a huge portion of the skull that you can actually fill in with an enormous amount of confidence. This is an honest representation though, it's just showing the bits that we actually have the bone of, but it doesn't mean that mirror imaging it over is is not um, is not methodologically correct. 
And unless you want to propose that Ardipithecus ramidus is like the only mammal ever that isn't bilaterally symmetric, which would be really silly. We're talking about Dougal Dixon shit there. So let's see what Ramad has to say about my favorite hominin. Ardipithecus ramidus, now known as Ardi, which is a hyperlink, <laughs> Sold as a missing link until Esteban Sarmiento, a primatologist, found Artie was pure ape fraud. Please tell me we're going to get more on Artie. Yeah, he goes. Uh, Look no face to reconstruct at all. Don't worry, they built you an imaginary one. Like, I guess he just didn't realize that those little pieces that are listed there or shown there at the top are, like, part of the face and skull. Which is fine. I, I don't mind that, that he has done that. Um... I do mind that he's presenting it in a book that is supposed to overturn the paradigm of human evolution. That irks me just a little bit. Um, and then he goes, he shows down here below what is not Artipithecus ramidus, an organism that is not Artipithecus ramidus, and says that they will build us an imaginary um, face. So I don't, unless that this unless this bottom one is supposed to be connected over to the uh, Bertil fossil, which I, I don't think it is. Maybe it is. I don't know. We'll find out in a moment. But right now we're still on Artipithecus ramidus. Now, Esteban Sarmiento is a primatologist, so of course he would think Artie is an ape, because it's a hominin, and hominins are apes. <laughs> like, uh, this would be like saying, you know, a, a, an expert on canines found that, uh, you know, wolves were just canids. Yes, they are canids, but they're also wolves. They're also, you know, canis lupus. That's just a silly thing to say. But Artipithecus ramidus, the reason it's it's posited as, as a potential hominin, is because we know it was a biped. Wow, how do we know that? Well, because it held its head on top of the vertebral column, and it has a pelvis that is much more similar to anatomically modern humans um, than it is to chimpanzees. So hold on, show you here. Maybe we can get a pelvis. We'll look at the pelvis here. Pelvis. Okie dokie. So, this is a good one here. Pantroglodytes, so that is a chimpanzee compared with Artipithecus ramidus, compared with uh, Australopithecus afarensis, compared with Homo sapiens. Matches with the rest of the hominins, doesn't it? Um, also supporting the fact that this animal was, in fact, a biped. So, it's not just the fact that we've got the, um, that the, the skull is held on top of the vertebral column, but it's also the pelvis. So, very, very cool, very hip. Here's another reconstruction here based off of the bits that we have uh, of the pelvis. Again, bilaterally symmetric. So we have a lot more than is just you know, kind of shown here. We know a lot more, that is, of the entire skeleton. So that's why it's a hominid. So yes, it is pure ape. So where are we? <laughs> Next. Next on the list, we've got the uh, Bertil fossil. All that was ever found were a few foot bones. Just another species of ape like Lucy to pretend to know any more based on such little fossil evidence is disingenuous. Another fail, he says. So, Bertil fossil. Let's pull her up. The Bertil fossil. Search. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, I see the importance of this. Um... Part of the reason why this is an important fossil is because it can be attributable to Australopithecines, and it does indeed show a more inline big toe or halix. That's why it's important. So if you look at the, the um, phalanges, the, the foot bones, um, toe bones rather, you're looking at those those phalanges and uh, metatarsals, I believe it is. Oh goodness, it's been a while. Metatarsals. I think that's the foot ones. Yeah, metatarsals. Um, you're going to see that they're slightly curved, right, in the same way that um, some apes are, but that they're also uh, supportive of a bipedal gait, right, which is why we know that whoever had these was a biped, and if they are matched to Australopithecines, which they are, it adds yet more credence to the idea that Australopithecines were in fact bipeds, although we don't need it necessarily because we already had Australopithecine toes, it's more helpful to just be able to diagnose the owner of the retail foot as an Australopithecine. So biped, not just an ape, but an ape, yes, um, but potentially a hominin. So next on the list, what do we got? Okie dokie, next we have Omphimetsi Kipili. Oh, okay, he just means Australopithecus Uh Popular name, Caribou. I don't know why he used that first name. Um, I've only ever seen it as Australopithecus sediba. Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology and Paleoanthropologist both find that Australopithecus ziba was just an Australopithecine and thus an extinct ape rather than a missing link human ancestor that they have been pushing fraud. So like, I don't know how he's 
like how he's managing to reason this out. Because all Shalopithecines are deemed as human ancestors. He hasn't shown any support in this section of the book, and indeed nowhere else in the book has he or Standing shown, that Australopithecines shouldn't be considered hominids. So saying it's an Australopithecine and thus isn't a human ancestor, while not actually explaining why an Australopithecine isn't a human ancestor, is like silly. It doesn't work. <laughs> um, but I think that it's important to talk about why Australopithecus sediba is so important. Because Australopithecus sediba shares a lot in common with Homo habilis, and Australopithecus sediba we have a lot of the postcrania for. So, MH1 and MH2, the Malapa hominins, pictures, here they are. So we have a whole lot of these hominins, and we are able to look at their postcrania, much of which was actually in articulation. That is to say, the bones were cemented, you know, uh, either in partial. Oops, I just knocked my glasses off because I was getting so excited. Um, either in partial articulation or full articulation with one another, so still in kind of anatomically correct position. So we know that these guys um, are indeed members of of the same species, right? Um, they're not bits and pieces, a waste basket, bone bag that, that uh, Stain for Truth and, and Raw Matt like to propose, that it's a mix of genus Homo and the Australopithecine bones. No, <laughs> because we find them in the rocks still put together in some places. And these organisms were indeed bipeds. They had brains that were much more Australopithecine-like, but their waist below, their waist and below was, was pretty, pretty Homo. I mean, it's pretty Homo looking. Um, you've got the angle of the femoral head, the, oh, I don't know that you guys can see this actually because I think I'm covering it up with my head. There it is. Hold on. Move me over here so you can actually see. <laughs> um, okay, there we go. Okay, so angle of the femoral head, bull shaped pelvis. You've got uh, the valgus knee down here, inline hallux or big toe. Uh, those are all derived anatomically modern traits. The hands are thought to be pretty modern too, if memory serves. They've got quite a long, or quite a, um, yeah, quite a long thumb, which is considered to be uh, a trait of genus Homo, although it's basal when compared to the very shortened thumbs and long fingers of modern panins, like chimpanzees. Um, bet you didn't know that humans had <laughs> traits that are basal and chips have traits that are derived. Uh, not many people appreciate it. And then um, Australopithecus sediba also has very primitive traits as well. It's got a very small brain, slightly prognathic face, although not nearly as much as, say, a chimpanzee. Uh, the upper arms and the shoulders, very primitive. Uh, but the hands, like I said, pretty modern. Rib cage is pretty primitive as well, although if, and I think, I think I'm remembering this correctly, the upper rib cage is more derived and the lower rib cage is more basal, I believe. Um, so it's a, per it's a great mosaic. It's, a, it's an excellent species to exemplify how change is occurring in hominins in different structures through time. Um, but yeah, these guys are an Australopithecine, and they have a lot of, of traits that are derived. And that's why creationists don't like to talk about them. But they are important. Oop, I should show you the in situ pictures too. In situ. In situ. Mm -mm. Here we go. Yeah, so they've got some really nice pictures of them still in the rock. Uh, and they are indeed in partial articulation in some cases, as you can see in Reconstruction of the Burial Position paper, which I've shown on this channel before. So you've you've all gotten a healthy dose of uh, Australopithecus sediba, fortunately or unfortunately. So I've actually had a bit of a wardrobe change. Some things came up and I ended up having to film the rest of this episode a few days later than I began it. So I'm, you know, post-workout, got a little tank top thing going on, and I'm raring and ready to cover the next hominin on Raw Mat and Standing for Truth's list, which is Australopithecus Barrel Ghazali, who's featured here, <laughs> right in the background. I was ready for you guys this time. He says, this fossil is classified under this genus hominin, yet all they have is a, in parentheses, lower jaw, from Chad in Central Africa. The discoverer keeps it under lock and key so it cannot be investigated. Classify this under fraud. Now, again, I really am just reading the sentences here. This is not kind of joking. In fact, sometimes I actually add words to make a little bit more coherent. The actual sentence looks something like, oh shoot, there it is. Hold on, hold on, there it is. The actual sentence looks something like that. It just says, Australopithecus barrel ghazali, fossil classified under this genus hominin. 
Okay. <laughs> he's mad that he's mad that the discoverer has it like in their own office at their own university, so no one can like a layman like they wouldn't just let raw man raw mat rather walk in covered in honey and like put his sticky hands all over this specimen. He also just doesn't have a picture of Barl Ghazali. He's got some other hominin pictured here because to my knowledge and he just says this in the paragraph right above. Barl Ghazali is represented by like a jaw, <laughs> a mandible actually, right here, in case you, you know, are, are missing it over to here to the upper left. So he's not even using the right picture, but I don't know, maybe that's expecting too much. So Australopithecus Barl Ghazali may or may not be a unique Australopithecine. It may just be, you know, a member of Australopithecus afarensis. But that being said, it, <laughs> there's nothing fraudulent about it. It's, it, it's just a fossil. I, I don't know why it's included on this list. The next hominin is Kenianthropus platyops, which is Greek for flat-faced man. And at least he does have the correct hominin pictured here, Kenianthropus platyops, right there. Classified as a new species of hominin roaming around East Africa at the same time as Australopithecus afarensis, ape-like features abound, small ear canal, small brain case, and because it had a flat face, they tried to show this as intermediary. In reality, it's not that flat and far more primate. Platyops was singled out by scientists because of the morphology of the maxilla, characterized by a flat and relatively orthognathic subnasal nasal region and its small molars, hiding the fact that it had thick enamel, a steep nasal cavity entrance, and moderate mandibular depth. It's just another in the long line of frauds. As we can see so far, evolution evolutionists hope, dream, and imagine. I, I mean, this feels like this section feels like it was written by Kent Hovind after he'd, like, had a night out on the town. Like, the, the slurred speech, you know, shilling for DAL, that kind of thing, minus the DAL stuff. But he does use the hope, dream, and imagine uh, line here up in the on, on the next page. So Kenianthropus platyops is unique because it's actually associated with some stone tools, hand axes, and the like, which means that it's a very early tool-using hominin. And while I don't understand... <laughs> what's going on here with his description, I will say it's a very unique hominin. He says here that it's been singled out by scientists because of its morphology morphology of the maxilla. It's not just the maxilla. It is, in fact, the orthognathic face, very flat. The brain case is small, but this isn't unexpected for hominins of this time period. Again, it's it's living contemporaneously with other australopithecines, or with australopithecines. Um, it's unique because it's got a, a kind of facial morphology that isn't very Australopithecine-like. It's, it's orthognathic. It's not even remotely uh, prognathic to the degree of what we even see in them. And you can tell that he's, <laughs> you can tell that this has been kind of a, a copy and paste section because I doubt that if you asked Ramat what a maxilla was, that he would be able to actually define that for you, let alone discussing things like um, mandibular depth, <laughs> like palate stuff, dentition, things like that. Again, he goofs the fact that he, he goes, he lists the primitive features first. He goes, Platyops was singled out by scientists, or uh, the, the uh, modern features first. Platyops was singled out by scientists because of the morphology of the maxilla, characterized by flat and relatively orthognathic subnasal region, and its small molars. So all of these are, of course, relatively derived characteristics, which is why Kenianthropus platyops is, is partially interesting, because it's got these derived features, but it's not an australopithecine, which means that there might have been some convergent evolution going on. Then he goes, hiding the fact that it had thick enamel, a steep nasal cavity entrance, and modern mandibular depth. So again, thick enamel is derived. So the, he's saying they picked it out because it's got these derived traits, but they hid the fact that it has derived traits. Like this would be the part where you would list exclusively basal traits that it has, so that you could promote that it's, what did he say, far more primate? For, I mean, this, again, you could do this with every single example, but this would be like finding a, a wolf skull and being like, it. trust me, this isn't a wolf. It's got canine features, okay? <laughs> um, he also doesn't really get in depth as to why the orthognathic face is far more primate than it is. Like, when he says primate, of course, he means basal, but is more basal than, than derived. Flat faces are pretty derived for some of these Miocene apes, so I don't know why he's trying to make that case. I mean, I do know why he's trying to make it, it's just very lazy because he doesn't actually present any reasons as to why it's not to be considered somewhat intermediate or somewhat derived. 
Next on the list, oh, I guess I should show you guys Kenny Anthropus Platyops so you can see it. Kenny Anthropus Platyops. It's a cool skull. I do like it. And let's look at this. This guy's a cutie. See that? Can you guys see that? My face is probably blocking it. Oh, shoot. I'm in the wrong tab. That would that be that checks out. Kenny Anthropus Platyops skull. Fortunately, Google's spying on me, so they can just <laughs> they can just move it on over, move my preferences on over. All right, let me move myself here so you can see Kenny Anthropus Platyops. There you go. Yeah, so flat face hominin, small brain case, um, somewhat reduced brow ridge. It's got pretty derived dentition. All in all, it's a cool hominin that may or may not be within the direct lineage of humans. Again, I think playing that game is kind of silly. It's going to be relatively impossible really to uncover what that direct lineage is, at least with our current tools. So could be a cousin, could be in the line, we don't really know. And that's the cool part about science. Oh, but it is indeed a hominin. <laughs> and this guy is indeed a hominin. It's got sort of on almost moving backwards of the globular uh, shape of the skull. I wonder where the foramen magnum is on this guy. Let's see. Bipedal? Are we saying that Kenny Anthropus platyops is bipedal? I would imagine. Let's see. Yeah, bipedal. They're probably basing this again on the frame and magnum position and angle. So it is a bipedal ape hominin, just like we are, coincidentally. All right, what's next on our list? Okay, next on the list we have Australopithecus diarmida, aka Paranthropus. We did this one already. It's just listed in here twice. He's got this in here two times. I'm gonna make myself big because you guys this is a this is a funny one to me just because it shows how impressively lazy this text actually is and that's because it's it's a it's effectively a an adapted pdf that raw mad and state for truth have been trying to circulate for a while now very little work was actually put into um fixing it to be in a book form so here we are on page 130 with Australopithecus diarmida right there 130 yeah and then we're gonna move back a couple pages to sorry it's on it's near the spine right there but uh 123 with uh, or there you go yeah Australopithecus diarmida look he even says the same stuff again nothing but three jaws were found again nothing but three jaws were found we're just doing it again. Okay, cool. But we're not actually going to look at it again because it's... Actually, I think he may have added some stuff. Yeah, he did add some stuff. He's just mad because he thinks it should be a paranthropine, but we did already kind of discuss that. I do like this line, though, which I think we already covered, too. No, we didn't do this one. So this line is kind of funny. Feel free to use your own brain, though, and look at the images of this gorilla-looking skull, then the fraudulent artist rendition of what it probably looked like. And then he has LOL in there. <laughs> Laugh out loud. Uh, this is a professional text that is going to demolish evolutionary theory. Keep that in mind. Next up... Oh, no, he's, he's look, he actually did add a little bit more. He adds the artist's rendition of... <laughs> of this particular Australopithecine. Did you notice they removed the gorilla crest from the skull on the replica? What gorillas actually looks like without artist modification, aka lies? He spells gorillas like the band. He, he literally has a Z on gorillas right there. I mean, this book feels a little bit like a shit post to me. I know that that's mean, and I'm sorry about that, kind of. Although I'm less sorry because I'm wasting time going through every sentence. Um, I think I, I reserve the right at this point to be like, this feels like, um, it feels like someone trying to parody creationists right down to like the bad grammar. I, I don't know, I would be insulted. Like if I was a creationist, a young creationist, I picked up this text, I would be like, who would write such, a, <laughs> such an overly exaggerated, overly gratuitous satire of creationism. This is making us look bad. Okay, next up, Homo rudolfensis. Only a handful of representative fossils exist. The researchers who analyzed the three 
More recently found fossils say we need more fossil material before we can confirm the species really belongs in our human genus. But that hasn't stopped evolutionists from claiming them as a part of our human evolution tree and possible missing link. This is just another extinct species of large primate. This ape had, ape had massive teeth, a long face, with like most big ape species, there's currently no, st no stone tools found in the same layers as Homo roughens as fossil, yet they pretend it used tools fraud. I, I mean, I appreciate this because there really isn't much of a defense for Homo rudolfensis, like for creationists for Homo rudolfensis, as we already went over in this exact episode. Homo rudolfensis. I'll pull the I'll pull the, uh, the old fossil up in the background so we can appreciate it. Hold on, move myself over here. Just bopping all around your screen like a DVD screensaver. All right, make myself small. Homo rudolfensis right here. Yeah, so we got a good representative Homo rudolfensis, flat face, um, vaulted forehead again, moving globular skull. Uh, it's it's a cool skull. I, I mean, I like Homo rudolfensis. We already went over it, um, so I don't see the need necessarily to rehash it. <laughs> His misrepresentation, though, of the conversations around this particular fossil is, it's funny, but it's I don't know, like, I feel like if I had the opportunity to explain this to Ramat, he wouldn't think that it's good enough, despite the fact that conversations around the placement of fossils occur in pretty much every branch of the Tree of Life for paleontology, even in arguments about dinosaurs and pterodons and uh, marine reptiles, all that kind of stuff, synapsids, where do they belong, specifically. The arguments, generally speaking, with early genus Homo, so Homo, hab homo habilis, Homo rudolfensis, Homo gabtingensis, um, other associated potentially new species, tends to be whether or not they, one, deserve their own genus, uh, like apart from Homo as a, transitionary, as a transitionary genus, or whether or not they belong more on the Homo end or more on the Australopithecine end. That doesn't change their morphologic features and their placement as a very solid um, mosaic of a gradient, right? That doesn't change that at all. Which is why you'll notice Romat rarely discusses the actual physical features unless he's copying and pasting them. Uh, from, from a Wikipedia article. So, Homo rudolfensis, yes, it's, it is a transitional species. I think that from what I've read about Homo habilis, from what I know, Homo habilis, from Homo rudolfensis, what I know about Homo rudolfensis, it, it is firmly in the human group. Homo rudolfensis, I believe, has an 800-ish brain case, uh, which overlaps with Homo erectus, which is why it should indeed be um, in our genus. Early Homo habilis, when you're kind of looking into that 500-ish, you might get away with putting those specimens in with Australopithecines. The problem is species variation, so variation of the morphology within individual species, uh, and sexual dimorphism, which might also be at play on whether where we're going to put these guys. My thinking is keep them all in Homo. I think there's reasonable um, support for keeping them in Homo. They do have large brain cases. They do have more derived facial features as a whole they meaning uh, specimens of Havilus, Gautengensis, and Rodolfensis, but they should stay very basal. I think that makes sense. So, next up, ooh, Lucy, Australopithecus afarensis. He goes fully ape, similar to a baboon type species as recent spinal column showing lumbar lordosis. That's the sentence. And then he's got pictures of, um, he's got pictures of, uh, abstracts, paper abstracts. This first one is from, let's see, uh, Prushoft and Gunther. It's, if trained to walk bipedally at a juvenile ape, at juvenile age over periods of some months or years, Japanese monkeys gradually acquire pronounced lordosis of the lumbar spine. This is called, this paper's titled, Curvature of the Lumbar Spine as a Consequence of Mechanical Necessities in Japanese Macaques Trained for Bipedalism. It's basically talking about, um, uh, like individual adaptation. So the spine is actually curving to accommodate for uh, Japanese macaques, a quadrupedal monkey having an upright stance. The spine is kind of conforming, warping to that kind of locomotion style. It's not good for these guys. It's not good for monkeys to be trained to do that. Lucy's back reassessment of fossils associated with AL288-1 vertebral column. And then he's basically like, look, see, we found that one of these individual vertebra belongs to a an ancient baboon. I've covered this before in past videos. Yes, that is true. If you've ever seen a picture comparing the vertebra of a human and a baboon, you'll be surprised at how similar they look. That was a dog snore, sorry, I got a dog right over there. Human, vertebra, and 
baboon vertebra. Let's see if we can not get a comparison picture here. Now, this is the picture that I usually like to use. So this picture is from an article titled Why Lucy's Baboon Bone is Great for Science and for Evolutionary Theory. And I think that this picture does a very good job explaining that premise. Here we've got a comparison of the uh, Theropithecus, aka ancient baboon vertebra, that is being compared to Homo sapiens. As you'll notice, they're very, very similar here on A, and then it shows over here with a modern papuan, so a modern baboon compared with the Lucy Theropithecus vertebra, AL288, and they are significantly more similar than the Homo sapiens is. Uh, specifically, you can look at the differences in the spinous process, so that's the top part, the, the little spine on the back of the vertebra, as well as the uh, superior articular process, the pedicles, the body, the vertebral foramen, things like that. And then down here in B, we've got a comparison of anatomically modern Homo sapiens with the Theropithecus vertebra, incorrectly assigned to Lucy, as well as Panin, so chimpanzees, um, Homo erectus, gorillas, a couple of different other mammals, uh, primates, etc. And I think that this is a really great example of explaining precisely the, the premise of the article, why finding a Theropithecus vertebra in an Australopithecine is very good for evolution. Because professional anatomists couldn't tell the difference between a very basal cercopithecoid like Theropithecus, a baboon, and a member of human ancestry, very sim a member was sort of on the human lineage, that is. The same would be true if you found um, a Homo sapiens vertebra, along the, assuming that they were similarly sized, which also the biggest afferens is a very small primate. They weren't very big, Lucy in particular. You know, we're thinking potentially sexually dimorphic here. Let me make sure you guys can see this here, because this is a good picture too. Move this over here. So this shows some of the lumbar vertebra all lined up, and you'll notice that they fit in articulation with one another. Now, when Lucy was dug up out of the ground, there were just, there was an influx of multiple different miscellaneous bones kind of sort of from the same area. And as mentioned in this article, folks didn't really double check to make sure that articulation was something that was occurring. Very similar to the case of Piltdown Man, after this came out, that there was a, a Theropithecus vertebra in with Lucy's, and, you know, to prove my point, tell me which vertebra it is. Which vertebra is the incorrect vertebra? It's quite difficult to tell the difference looking on the outside for a layman, let alone, you know, even for an anatomist, let alone a layman, I suppose I should say. Uh, they're very similarly sized. The only reason that Meyer and, I believe it was Meyer here, that Meyer kind of sussed out that it was unique is because it had sort of this washed out appearance um, and, and was thus unique from the other vertebrae. It wasn't that it, and then, you know, upon closer inspection, it didn't quite articulate with the others as well. You can also double check this with things like uh, laser, lit works work with lasers on articular surfaces. So scanning the articular surface where two joints connect and, you know, vertebra would fit that. Here's the specific relative, the specific baboon, Therapithecus dardi, most common monkey around the time that Lucy was alive. Um, and I think, I don't know, I think that this is, this is quite telling. It also allowed for us to look at the rest with intense scrutiny uh, and all subsequent fossils with intense scrutiny to double, triple, quadruple check that everything was copacetic. Uh, challenging assumptions, strengthen science. I think this is something that creationists often forget because they like to they like to imagine that there's this conspiracy going on. And let me find the particular quote because I, I quite liked this this quote here. Discovering an uh, discovering an anomaly doesn't undo the groundbreaking work of Johansson and others, said Dr. Meyer. Yeah, Lucy is definitively a biped. That's something that we'll talk about in just a second. The Australopithecines were absolutely bipeds. Um, but I want to find this one quote because it's quite good. Uh, there are many bones to contend with. Some of the original photos of Lucy, you can see fingers and toes mixed up before they made corrections. Similarly, our work doesn't change much. It's simply continuation of refining their work. This is how science progresses. We don't leave things unexamined. We test hypotheses and retest them. I'm confident in that in the coming decades, all our work will be re-examined as it should be. That's actually not the one I'm looking for, but I like that one as well. I want to look for the one where they're like challenging the status quo is something that should happen, um, which again would defy the, the conspiracy that creationists often push. There, hold on just a second. Different texture. Yeah, this is talking about the difference in size, although it was minute. It would have been possible to do this work without re examining the original. 
The sheen isn't something that you can see in measures and casts, so they actually had to get out there and put their hands on it, which is quite cool. That would be really neat. Um, let's see. Close examination. Colleagues found the majority. No, that's not it. Okay. Here, here it is. All right. When you look at a fossil, this is what Meyer is saying, when you look at a fossil that's been studied by, by the masters for 40 years, you tend to accept what they conclude. This is true, Dr. Meyer said. In most walks of life, it is common not to question the masters, but the reason why the scientific method works so well is that we are compelled to question. And it's this kind of scrutiny that has allowed us to reassure the scientific community ourselves and indeed in the broader scope of paleontology as a whole reaching into forensics even that we can tell when bones fit together when they belong to a single organism it's this kind of scrutiny that allows for that um so good good deal good deal with that but i'm sure he's going to continue complaining about it Oh, here's something that's quite funny. Complaining about lumbar lordosis occurring, which by the way, he calls a uh, lumbard lordosis. That is not, that's not how you, uh, that's not how you spell or say the word. I'll hold that up for you there so you can see it. Oh, can you see it? Yeah. Wait, can you? I don't actually know if you can or not. I think you can. Yeah, there it is, right there. Lumbard lordosis with the D at the end. These are the folks that are returning evolution, you guys. The top brass exclusively. Then he goes, her big chimp-like arms suggest she hadn't yet abandoned the tree. So first complaining about the um, the vertebra. Actually, I don't know that we complained about it yet. Oh, yeah, so they talk about lumbar lordosis, and then they complain about the bone layer, but we've already covered that. So we'll just move along as it were. So yes, Australopithecines had very ape-like arms. I'm using ape in the, in the sense of uh, more basal arms. Very long compared even to the legs. Uh, but interestingly enough, they were still bipeds. Let's take a look at some of our, let's see. Australo, are there bones? That is what I was going to say. Australopithecus afarensis pelvis. All right, there we go. Now, as Kent would like to say, ah, you could put this in front of a four-year-old and they'd be able to tell the difference. Uh, which, which is the odd man out? You know, it's, <laughs> it's actually not, comparing with the chimp, it's not going to be Australopithecus afarensis. This pelvis is very bowl-shaped, which is the odd man out. Here's a chimp with these extremely large sideways or rather forward-faced iliac blades uh, that then transition in Australopithecines and stay transitioned in humans. There's a difference in the femoral head. The femoral head, I harp on this kind of stuff all the time. The femoral head of Australopithecines and of humans is angled as such along with the valgus knee, the angle of the knee, to hold the weight underneath the body. The toe, the hallux that is, is significantly more in line, and the spinal column is also built for holding that weight upright. Here's another nice comparison. Now, usually people complain, and by people I mean creationists, they say, okay, it's not actually fair because what happened with Lucy is they reconstructed the pelvis. And yes, they did reconstruct the pelvis. The pelvis was pretty crushed. But the reason that they reconstructed it like this is reconstructing it as the Creation Museum does with Lucy as a knuckle walker. Uh, Creation Museum Lucy like this. There we go. There's, there's this one. Sorry. Reconstructing the pelvis like this is not anatomically possible. Biomechanically, you can't do this with the bones that have been given. That's why she's a biped. It's in combination with, with things like the valgus knee and the um, foramen magnum being right situated up underneath the skull with the proper position and angle, the spinal column, and the, the uh, inline toes, all that kind of stuff. It's all fine and dandy, but you literally can't reconstruct it this way. This would be like finding a human skeleton and reconstructing that human as a quadruped, a knuckle-walking quadruped. So, can't be done. Cannot be done. Then they complain, let's see, okay. She died falling out of a tree. So to say she lived walking around the ground proves their story, walking around on the ground proves their story is a fraud. Uh, and then he's got fraud in bold. So the common assessment of Lucy, as has been for a while now, is that Lucy, Australopithecines, that is, I should say, and Artopithecus ramidus and Cadaba and Aurora and Sidelinthus Chidensis earlier were 
living in the, in fact, we can prove this using isotopic ratios, but they were living in these deciduous woodlands. They're not jungles. They're not living in jungles, which is to say you couldn't live at their body size an entirely arboreal lifestyle. It's not possible given their habitat. There weren't the trees to live that way. So what's probably happening is staying in the trees during the evenings when there's lots of savanna uh, predators out on the grounds. This is very similar to what baboons do, by the way. But coming down from the trees and walking from food patch to food patch in the heat of the day. Because as it turns out, biomechanically speaking, walking on two legs is significantly more efficient than walking on four. That, it, that may be hard to believe, and you do take a speed cut. But if you're going in the middle of the day, no predators are going to be out. We, we see this today with, with particularly water-efficient ungulates. They go out in the middle of the day, and they typically don't get preyed upon because there's nothing there to prey upon them. Lions with their heavy fur coats, similar things with cheetahs, how they have to expend lots of energy very quickly. And leopards who are ambush predators and, and have to stay in areas that are relatively um, uh, filled with vegetation and things of that nature, although they can do that sneaking thing a bit. It's, it's consistent with what we see today, right? Now, Again, what we're seeing here is, suggestion, is a suggestion of, rather, an, an organism that's spending some of the time in the trees and some of the time on the ground. When it's coming to the ground, though, this organism physically, again, could not have possibly been a quadruped. It had to have been a biped, biomechanically speaking. So that's something that they're just going to have to accept. It's a bipedal ape, and it's also um, within our lineage. Um, isotopic, uh, ratios, isotopic ratios, my mistake, do bolster this idea of a um, up in the trees in the evenings when it's safe and convenient, coming down for foraging. And it has modern day analogies as well. But yeah, she did try die falling out of a tree, as do many monkeys today do, <laughs> including ones that are primarily terrestrial, like baboons. Reality, a species similar to Lucy is still alive in Sumatra. I don't really know what this is trying to say. I, maybe they're talking about like a, a pygothrix, genus pygothrix, so some of our suspensory organisms. I don't know, this feels very conspiracy to me because I've never actually heard of it before. Uh, is Lucy still alive and well and living in Sumatra? We'll Google that and see what we can't find. Is Lucy still alive? And well, I'm living in Sumatra. I don't know, you tell me. Well, we've got a lot of woolly rhinos. Okay, it's just Lucille Ball. I don't think they're talking about that one. <laughs> okay, we're gonna go ahead and, uh, and, and move on then, because this is just uh, really goofy. Okay, now we're talking about the knuckle walking mechanism. Johansson has gone to Africa on a grant to find the missing link. Two weeks before his grant money ran out, he found Lucy. How coincidental, I suppose Raw Matt would say. But bones are bones. You can't fake them. To me, it sounds like a very lucky break for Donald Johansson. And, you know, probably a lot of those other individuals who, who went out and found one of the 300-plus specimens that are attributed to Australopithecines. I guess they were must have been real close to that grant money, too. Real close to running out of that grant money, too. Uh, okay, now we talk about the concave convex locking system. I think he's talking about the knuckle walking locking system. So, first of all, it's much more degraded in Lucy than it is in chimpanzees. So the idea is that you've got chimps that have this powerful knuckle locking system so that when they walk on their knuckles, um, they can kind of strengthen their entire arm and put their, bear their weight on that front quite easily in a sort of semi-upright posture. Now, Australopithecines have somewhat of a knuckle locking system, although, and as he shows here in the picture here, uh, it's quite, here, hold on, why am I always doing this wrong? It's degraded. So this is Lucy in the middle, Australopithecus afarensis, and then humans on the right. And this is precisely what you would expect if you're dealing with the evolution of something from a knuckle walker or something that needs to lock its knuckles, lock its, um, its hands for moving around in suspensory locomotion in the trees to something that's a biped. Because when something is bad, it isn't, it's going to be selected against, right? But if something doesn't, it's neutral, it tends to hang around until there's a reason to select against it. So moving upright and still having lockable knuckles, that isn't going to be something that's selected against right off the bat. A primary example in the modern day is the tailbone of, of modern humans. Right? We don't, our tailbone, while it does have some benefits in strengthening the pelvic floor, it's not 100% necessary, but it sticks around because why select against it? There's nothing to actively act 
against humans having these tailbones. Same with the rest of the uh, with the rest of the apes. In fact, hold on, ape tailbones. I think this would be kind of interesting here because I I believe I saw. Oops, shopping. No thanks. I think there's an interesting comparison here if I can find it. The chimpanzees actually have a, a more dwarfed tailbone than modern humans do, which is kind of, I don't know, fascinating. This is a human coccyx or tailbone right here, kind of curves underneath. I, I believe it serves for, for some attachment purposes. Let's try chimpanzee coccyx, see what we get here. Uh, mm. Yeah. So it's comparatively small. So we technically, it seems that we've got more impressive coccyx than um, a more impressive coccyx than than some chimps do. More robust coccyx than some chimps do. Okay. Initially, the ironically, the experts who constructed Lucy and didn't even have the capacity nor skull to determine that a part of her spine was actually a modern day baboon. That's also just a sentence that's in this book. Ironically, I'm gonna read it again so you can really soak this in. Ironically, the experts who constructed Lucy and didn't even have the capacity nor skull, I don't even want to play at what that might be attempting to say. That's nearly impossible to parse. To determine that a part of her spine was actually modern day baboon. Um, and the other experts over the decades let it slip by over 40 years because no one was actually looking at it because we keep pulling up new bones. Uh, no one could actually tell the difference. That is how ape-like Lucy actually is. This is the incredible irony of this entire situation. You also can't really tell the difference outside of size between a modern baboon, papio vertebra, and that of a human. Because we're both primates. Primate vertebra share a lot of similarities in those things like the transverse process and the spinous process and the size of the shape of the body, etc. Um, and again, it's, who, who was it that found out that it was a, a Theropithecus vertebra? It was anthropologists, it was paleoanthropologists who found it out. And then they went and applied that scrutiny to the other fossils and didn't and find, found rather no other such misidentifications. So Lucy, the biggest fairy tale of them all, they know it's a lie and push it anyways. Um, and then that's, oh wait, okay. This is the garbage that they teach kids and taught us in school, okay. I know he's not actually giving credit for any of these, um, citing his sources for any of these pictures, but that would be good practice, Ra Matthew, if you do indeed publish a, uh, an updated version, which I think you should. I'll be posting this review on Amazon as well, along with a link to this playlist. Next, Neanderthals. Past calculations suggested that anywhere from 35 to 70% of the Neanderthal genome could exist in modern people. Every day inches closer to being accepted as a genuine human, up to 40% genetic relation now, soon to be 70%. Here's a friend of mine with 20% on 23andMe. Uh, and then he has 249 for, I, I guess this is like the 23andMe for Homo neanderthalensis. I think he must be reading this wrong and it's too blurry for me to actually make out what most of the text is saying. If you can see it here, because typically, Typically, the maximum that humans are going to have of Neanderthal DNA within them is going to be like five to seven percent, and that's pretty generous. Denisovans gets a little higher in Southeast Asian populations at around 12 percent, and while it is possible that we can find a massive amount of Neanderthal DNA uh, across the entire human population and reconstruct a large amount of it because each person who has Neanderthal DNA might carry a different part of that genome within them. You're not getting 100%. And the way that we know that, right, that humans, I mean, that's actually a cool thing that you can do with genetics, but I digress. The way that we know that Neanderthals aren't humans, like as Neanderthal, or as Neanderthal, as Romat puts it, genuine humans underlined, is because we've sequenced their whole genome. We don't need the human genomes to figure out the Neanderthal genome. We've sequenced their genome from their own remains. And they're only 99.7% similar to humans. For record, chimps are 98.8%. So about a 1.5% or 0.9%, I guess you would say, uh, greater. Neanderthals greater than, than chimpanzees, 0.9% greater. So that 0.2% is doing some pretty serious work. And 
it's the thinking right now is that where the most work is probably going to be done is in like DNA methylation. So the epigenome is actually probably going to be playing a much larger role in what makes humans different from Neanderthals and indeed different from other animals and what makes lions different from tigers and rats different from mice, given how, how close their genomes are and yet how differently some of these genes express. That being said, <laughs> genetic similarity by necessity dictates relation. It dictates the lineage there. Because the same way that we determine that 98.8% with humans and chimps, or that 99.7% with humans and Neanderthals, in that same, like, comparison, that methodology, it's used for paternity tests in humans. So I'm thinking, in fact, actually, <laughs> I tend to, to add a little asterisk there because it's asterisk, as I should say, there, because it's actually quite a bit more complicated when we're comparing full species because we're using the full genome, not just highly variable pieces of it as we do for paternity tests. So it's pretty solid. We know that Neanderthals are not human. They are too genetically different from us. We don't even know if they were capable for speech, of people of speech, rather. Although it, it, it's possible, we just don't know for sure. They don't have that entire genetic toolbox at their disposal. From its first discovery in 1856 till now, you can see the artist's interpretation based off of their belief in evolutionism. Um, so, so Neanderthals were one of the first hominins, I believe it was the first hominin that was actually discovered. So it was incorrectly hailed as this classic perfect missing link rather than kind of where we would put Homo habilis uh, today or also the Casidiva today. So it's depicted as very ape-like, and now they're rather human-like, which I think is quite fair, considering they're much more similar to us than many of the other hominids. Then he goes, oh, yeah. is that really all we get on Neanderthals? I guess that is. I guess that's all we get. You would think that they, okay, no, no, he goes back to it a little bit more later. Okay. Cro-Magnon is now accepted as a genuine human. Solo man, Nagong Nong, was totally human all along. So I want to actually double check because Cro Magnon. I can let's see here. I want to get us a full Cro Magnon. I'm gonna give us a full brain case. Because I believe it's archaic Homo sapiens. But I want to double check. Because yes, it, it is archaic Homo sapiens. It is a human, quote unquote. Although <laughs> it is significantly more basal in its facial morphology, um, the shape of the back of the skull, some of its postcrania, and also I don't believe anyone ever was touting Cro-Magnon man as like this missing link between humans and the common ancestor of humans and chimpanzees. Male individual, approximately 40 years old. As you can see, there are some pretty robust features here. 28,000 years ago. That's actually not, actually, that's actually not archaic. That's pretty anatomically modern, which is interesting because it does still have some of these more boxy features. But interestingly enough, the, <laughs> the kind of point here to be made is that it's, it's never not been anatomically modern human. It's never not been a human remain. Not been touted as something else and then evolutionists are like, well, we got an egg on our face now. Human from day one. Solo man, Gong Dong. Let's see here. Mm -mm -mm. Oops. Mm, gong Dong man. Ooh. Maybe he messed this up. Solo man, I guess we'll try. Solo man hominin. Might be, might get us there. Yeah, here it is. Homo erectus. Human all along. Nope. It's Homo erectus. <laughs> That's a very distinct species. Uh, brain volume is quite large, ranging from 1013 to 1251, which is definitely more modern Homo erectus. But let's see if we've got any postcrania going on. Agent taphonomy, classification. Okay, Java man, Rhodesian man, solo man are commonly grouped together as canthropoid australoid lineage this is all pretty pretty old stuff anatomy here we go oh i see so we're looking at several individuals he's listed this as a single individual but it turns out it's multiple i must say i'm shocked 
are characterized by more derived traits than earlier jaw than Homo erectus, notably a larger brain size, elevated cranial vault, reduced postorbital constriction, and less developed brow ridges or superorbital ridges. Closely resemble earlier Homo erectus, like Peking man, there's a slight sagittal keel running across the midline of the skull. Compared to other Asian Homo erectus, the forehead is proportional, proportionally low and also has a low angle of inclination. Brow ridges do not form a continuous bar like in Peking man, but curve downwards to the midpoint, forming a nasal bridge. It's quite thick, especially at the lateral ends. Like Peking man, frontal sinuses are confined between the eyes rather than extending into the brow region. Compared to Neanderthals and modern humans, the area of the temporal muscle would have covered is rather flat. Um, and then it goes on and so on and so forth. It's not an anatomically modern human. That's the point. In fact, there are so many individuals that they can say that with relative certainty. So no, Ramat, not human all along. Okay, Dennis Sovins. DNA test proof it was human all alone. Just very large. Dennis Sovins were really humans who were just Russian descent. Why? Why am I treating this as seriously as I'm treating it when the, the sentence structure is like, it's like lower than the top of the class third grader that you would encounter at any public school in the United States. The, someone didn't go over this. And I certainly hope for the sake of our friend standing for truth, Monkey for Banana himself, that this is entirely a raw mat chapter, despite standing for truth also getting second billing, I suppose you would say. Uh, because this is really, really poorly written. This, this is... You would flunk any kind of higher education for sure with this kind of sentence structure, this kind of composition, but like I don't even know that you would pass on from third to fourth grade writing like this. Evolutionary theory has taught us one thing, drop common sense at the door, just take their word for it. No, it's anatomical measurements of probably up to thousands of individuals across you know, decades of modern time and millions of years of ancient time, down to, you know, the, the itty bittiest measurement. Reconstructions abound. <laughs> Muscle attachment sites are considered. Crania and postcrania, of course, are considered. Taphonomy is considered. Um, isotopic ratios are used to find out what kind of habitat these guys lived in. Genetics is utilized. It, I mean, it, it is not an eyeballing it game as is presented in this group of papers. Evolutionary theory has taught us one thing. Don't investigate and make sure to drop all common sense at the door. Just take their word for it. Again, that's not me. That's how this is written. I, I want to be very clear. I am not reading this twice because I've, I've contracted some form of of early onset d dementia or something. It just says it twice. It just says evolutionary theory has taught us one thing, drop common sense at the door, just take their word for it. Two times. And the number is still in the middle. <laughs> the page number is still in the middle. Holy moly. Berkeley evolutionary biologist F. Clark Howell in 1996 concluded there is no encompassing theory of human evolution. Alas, there never really has been um, okay. We can look that up, I guess. Uh, let's see. F. Clark Howell, 1996. F. Clark Howell, 1996. There is no encompassing theory of evolution. Alas, there never has been. Ah. Inherit the spin. Oh, this is the Discovery Institute. How fascinating. Wow, an ID <laughs> website. How fascinating. Let's see. I wonder if they'll include the exact, uh, I wonder if they'll include the exact quote that Ramat uses. Contrary to the NCSE's claim of considerable agreement, field of human origins, paleontology is one of the most contentious in biology. According to experts in the field, this is because of subjective interpretations of relatively meager evidence. Yeah, it's just a, <laughs> It's just a, it's just a crypt quote. Where's the full quote? Can we please get that? Let's see here. Oh, he died in 2007. In... Compass. Compass. How strange. It's like you can't find it in the conventional literature. I wonder, that's so weird. Hmm. Darwin, then and now, the most amazing story in the history 
of science. Let's see. I wonder if I can, okay, no, we're not doing that. I'm not trying to navigate Google Books. Maybe this has got, this has got G Store, all the evidence you'll ever need. A scientist believes in, ah, oh, this, okay, why is it only, it's only religious spins that are including the full quote. Odd. Well, I'm just going to chalk this one up to, to quote mining, I suppose. If I can't find the original quote, I can't find it. I mean, I suppose I have no choice but to take their word for it, although I'm skeptical. Essays and thoughts, maybe? Who the heck is Lauren C. Saunders? Oh my gosh. Just show me the quote. I'm not going over that. Let me know in the comments if you sussed this one out. In the same year, Ann Gibbons, correspondent for Science Magazine, reflect on the ever-increasing mystery of presupposed human evolution. Quote, the story of human evolution has lately become as complicated as a Tolstoy novel. Yes. Human evolution is very cons constipated, very complicated. Uh, I sound like Weird Al. It's very complicated. That is not saying that it's not real. It's like, genetics is really complicated. Well, I guess it's fake. The chief science writer for Nature, Henry G, declared hominid evolution is as mysterious as ever. True. The genome's pretty mysterious too. And boy, space? Don't even get me started on space. I guess we should just shut down all STEM fields while we're at it. Anytime there's a question, shut it down. Evolutionary theory has taught us one thing. Drop common sense at the door. Just take their word for it three times in two pages. How? How did no one catch this? Look, it's 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 over here too. Is it supposed to be like an archetype? Is this the joke? Is it is the joke that he just repeats it over and over again? Oh my god, do you think it's gonna happen a fourth time? I can't believe I didn't catch this. I guess I, by this point I was pretty delirious, I think, when I was reading through this the first time. Again, I just put no and no next to, <laughs> next to these two. The Bone Peddler, Selling Evolution, New York Macmillan, 1984, in, sim in a simple and memorable format, fix an evolutionist exposes the twisted story of man's alleged fossil history. I, I don't... I guess this is just like a source that he's listing? The fossil record has caused Darwin more grief than joy. Stephen Jay Gould pined in 1980 in the legendary book The Panda's Thumb. Berkeley evolution... Berkeley evolutionist biologist, Ber sorry, Berkeley evolutionary biologist F. Clark Howell concluded there is no encompassing theory of human evolution, unless there never really has been. The chief science writer for Nature, Henry G., declared hominid evolution is as mysterious as ever. Where's my pen? Where's my. Alright. Alrighty. Here we go. Okay. First, it's here. Uh, quoting from uh, from F. C. Clark, sorry F. Clark Howell, and then it's over here. Mhm, mm right. And then we get a quote from Henry G. Here and here. I'll line him up there so you can see that as well. So you can pause that and take a gander if you feel like it. And then we've got three times for evolutionary theories taught us one thing: drop common sense at the door. Just take their word for it. Three times. Two in quick succession. One here, just take their word for it, and then and then just take their word for it again. And we're here. Uh-huh. Two underlined spots. And then we've got it again. Over here. Just so you can see it every single time. I think that a trained Japanese macaque could do a better job editing than Ramat did. In the same year, Ann Gibbons, correspondent from Science Magazine, reflected on the ever-increasing... There we go. It wouldn't be a raw mat section if you didn't repeat something three times, two or three times. Three times for Just Take Their Word For It, twice for F. Clark Howell, twice for Henry G., and twice for Ann Gibbons. Awesome. Really good. They changed the truth of God into a lie, and they worshipped the creation rather than the creator. Romans 1, 25. I sure wish there was a verse in the Bible that talked about only putting your best work out there, trying your best all the time, and hiring a good editor. 
If that is not dramatic enough, note the following confession by an evolutionary zealot, recently published in the Talk Origin Archive. First of all, there is no recently used with Talk Origins. Talk Origins is ancient. It, it hasn't been updated in like a decade. Funny thing is, it doesn't need to be updated because creationists are still using the exact same arguments. Okay, titled The Prominent Hominoid, sorry, Hominid Fossils, the bold emphasis is added by this writer, which I guess is where I'm at. There's little consensus on what our family tree in, in Hessines? Hessines? Is that a word? This one might be on me. We'll, we'll double check. Hold on. Ihesines? No. No, it's not a word. Ihesines. Ihekines? I don't know. You tell me. If you're in the chat, tell me what this word means. Because I don't know. Right there. Ihehi. Look, it's not it's not a holdover. Family tree. It has signs. Then it lists Paranthrop or Aethiopicus, Robustus, and Boisei, with that's genus Paranthropus for each of those three. Are not ancestral to us, being a side branch that left no descendants. Whether Homo habilis is descended from Australopithecus afarensis, Africanus, both of them or neither of them, is still a matter of debate. But of those things are true. It's possible that none of the known Australopithecines is our ancestry. That's true too. Could be a different Australopithecine. The discoveries of Artipithecus ramidus and Australopithecus animensis are so recent it's hard to say what effect they will have on current theories. That should be very telling that this is a talk origin quote because it's relatively recent to talk origins because this was probably written in like 2005. Um, it is generally accepted that Homo erectus is descended from Homo habilis or at least some of the fossils assigned to Homo habilis but no relationship between he puts underscore erectus, I guess they mean homo erectus, homo sapiens, and neanderthalensis is still unclear. That should be telling too, because we know that neanderthalensis and sapiens are sister species. There's been incredible genetic work done on that. Because we have both full genomes, we're capable of doing it. Neanderthal affinities can be detected in some specimens of both archaic and modern sapiens. They then said homo halus evolved into homo erectus. They, then they recanted that remark when they discovered they lived at the same time. Their coexistence makes it unlikely that homo erectus evolved from homo habilis, explains Maeve Felicule, one of the lead off, and then he cuts it off. So yes, there are many contemporaneous hominins. That being said, I would propose, and there are many paleoanthropologists that propose this, and I know because I've talked to some of them, that contemporaneity doesn't mean that one did not beget the other. Just because there is a split up of the population, adaptation of the new population, and you know the speciation eventually, doesn't mean that that first population that beget the latter has to go extinct. That doesn't necessarily track. That being said, I think it's fair to say that whatever Homo erectus evolved from, whether it's Homo habilis, Homo rudolfensis, Homo gaugengensis, or also the sediba, depending on where we're going with East or South Africa, probably looked similar to one or all of those particular hominins. And again, evolution doesn't claim, evolutionary theory with human evolution does not, nor has it ever claimed, to be able to track a very specific lineage. It's about a gradient. Can we show the gradient of change through geologic time? And the answer is a resounding yes. That entire paragraph is a concession to the utter ignorance, confused ignorance of human origins from the Darwinian perspective. And so when you read it of another new discovery relative to man's apish ancestors, file it away because within a few months or years, the story will be different and proven wrong. The next time someone shows you a large skull with a low cranium, large eyebrow ridge and says, look at the missing link, show them this. And it's a picture of a, an African man and a skull next to it. That's in very good taste, I assure you. Not only this, but Neanderthal fossils created a huge dilemma for Darwin as well. How could a larger brain precede a smaller brain? Evolution doesn't claim any kind of absolute fitness. Creationism claims that. How could yet still be seven times larger than predicted? I, I, I don't know why we're talking about that. Like Darwin didn't know about genetics. Darwin founded evolutionary theory. He didn't perfect it. This is like saying that <laughs> this is like saying that because Einstein improved upon classic Newtonian physics by understanding quantum physics and relativity or not quantum physics just relativity that like like Newton was a dumb idiot and it's really stupid and oh and that Newtonian physics is bad and should never be used. 
Okay, Darwin cautiously noted it must be admitted that some skulls of very high antiquity, such as the famous one of Neanderthal, are well-developed and capricious, so large. For Darwin, the Neanderthal skulls were too large to have preceded humans, so he never dealt with this conflicting problem again. None of that is true. Darwin never actually had an issue with Neanderthalensis. In fact, Neanderthalensis and Archaeopteryx lithographica, both discovered during his lifetime, heavily validated Darwin's theory of evolution. He went to his grave knowing he was right. Today, we know the brain size does correlate to intelligence in human beings. No, absolutely 100% it doesn't. Like, that's just wrong. <laughs> intelligence and brain size do not correlate at all. Okay, that is just, oh gosh, hold on. Oh, uh, before we move on, I actually want to say one more thing about this bit, about comparing, you know, modern humans with, out, on the outward basal looking features, quote unquote, usually they use like, boxers with very almost pinnish looking heads that does not support the idea that <laughs> like ancient specimens of hominins were just deformed humans because of one major thing brain case size but also the details of measurements for facial morphology the post crania the way that the biomechanics hash out isotopic ratios radiometric dating all of that stuff means that you can't just say boy some living humans have really weirdly shaped skulls. I guess that must mean all ancient hominins were just humans or apes with really weirdly shaped skulls. Like all of physics and every measurement ever taken of these skulls defies that hypothesis. The fossil record has caused Darwin more grief than joy. Stephen J. Gould. Look, look at that. Look. Break out the. Gotta break this out again. Do another circle. Let's try accidentally attempt to read this tome once again. Where There it is. We're two for J. Gould as well. Stephen J. Gould, twice mentioned. I've been scorned by this book too many times. Fossil evidence today has become more inference, speculation, and storytelling than science. Nope. Just throw forensic science out with the trash too and all of paleontology while you're at it, Ronat, and standing for truth. Most of the time, so few fossils are found that missing gaps of evidence are filled in with presumption. No, measurements are carried through. Like bilateral symmetry is utilized. Parsimony is <laughs> incorporated. It's just, during the 20th century, at stake is whether Neanderthals are transitional species different from modern humans or simply a human ethnic group. No, no, Neanderthals are not transitional species. We know genetically that they are sister species. No one is saying they're transitional, like from some other hominin to humans, like that they're bridging that gap. No one is saying that. Darwin had no idea, so classified them as maybe pre-human intermediaries and walked away. Wrong. Technology today, though, is answering the question. Just a few years ago, a team led by Svante Pabo from the Department of Evolutionary Genetics at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Germany eroded genetic difference between Neanderthals and modern humans after publishing the full Neanderthal genome. He knows about it. That means there's no excuse for pretty much every other statement, sentence, word, or brief thought that Romat has ever had about Neanderthals. <laughs> Commenting on the findings, John Hawkes, assistant professor of anthropology at the University of Wisconsin, told BBC News that they're us, we're them. This is a really surprising thing for many of us, noted Professor Chris Stinger, research leader at Human Origins at London's Natural History Museum. The, uh, is the implication that there has been some interbreeding between Neanderthals and modern humans in the past? Yes, interbreeding has occurred. Since different species cannot interbreed, Neanderthals can no longer be considered a transitional species. No one ever thought that they were transitional, like between, again, an ancient hominin and humans, at least not at all since any kind of genetics was published, nor since we found uh, Homo heidelbergensis. Early on, I suppose I should retract that a bit. Early on, yes, Neanderthals were potentially considered to be some kind of transitional species, but that's mostly, that's mostly rather because of their biogeography and very similar, albeit basal traits when compared to humans in the face and in the crania. But genetics blew that out of the water. Coincidentally, the genetics is also further affirming this idea that humans came out of Africa 300,000 years ago, not 6,000. Again, we are, every time we sequence, we actually sequenced the bonobo genome a couple months ago, uh, full genome, and we are more closely related to bonobos than we previously thought. So I'll put a pin in that too there, Ron Matt. Evidence for the Neanderthals, a transitional link to modern humans has been eroded to the edge of extinction. Only the most diehard evolution still fight it. No. No. 
We must abandon once and for all views that of modern human superiority over archaic ancient humans. I agree with that. Terms archaic and modern lose all meaning as to concepts of modern human replacement of all other lineages uh, from viewpoint human evolution, from tree to braid, BBC News in 2013. This was also, I believe, before the Cistern Genome paper published. Oh gosh, when was that? 2018, maybe? Or 16? I can't quite remember. Um, I'm going to see something really quick. Yeah, interbreeding. So like... Wolves and dogs can interbreed. They're considered different species. We've got Canis familiaris and Canis lupus. Two different species, right? Um, dogs and coyotes can interbreed. Two different species. Cats and servals, domestic cats and servals can interbreed. Two different species. Interbreeding does not necessarily mean a unique species. It's unfortunately a bit more complicated than that and serves to the idea that biological species concept is kind of dumb and silly. But... I will say, and I tossed it to the ground because I'm actually starting to get a headache from all of this numb nuttery, but let me see what our next chapter is, because that was a big old long one. The next one is, ooh, radiometric dating, refuting millions of years. Uh, and this one's by Standing for Truth, so that's great. I actually put nope raw math, that doesn't bode well because that means that our, that means that all old SFT was writing like Ramat. And then we've got Cladistics by Ramat, which I kind of already covered in a video, but we will do a bit more with it next time. Maybe, maybe the last, maybe next episode will be last episode and we'll go ahead and do refuting dating methods and Cladistics at the same time. What do you think? Leave a message in the comments or if you'd want, we can do them separately. Anyways, um, aside from being just incredibly poorly written, barely comprehensible by anybody who expects to be reading a, a, a text that was typed up by an adult rather than a child. Outside of those factors, the information in the missing link section is also just broadly incorrect or misrepresentative. This is a very poor assessment of hominins. It's an even poorer, <laughs> it's an even poorer, um, sort of exhibition of the author's knowledge of how evolution is intended to work, how it's proposed to work. Um, and it's it's frankly not worth anybody's time. I, I mean, again, I'm going to be leaving an Amazon review after I've done this entire book. I want someone, those who are considering buying it, to have access to something that is rather comprehensive, that has gone through it essentially word by word, so that you can know and understand why this book is is best used as kindling, at least until it gets a better editor, for God's sake. So, my gentle and, of course, very modern apes, I will see you next time here in the Library of Errors.